Well, hey, kids, it's your good buddy Uncle Ben, and as many of you guys already know, I likes to play me the big guitar. But honestly, my least favorite style of music to play bass in is objectively my favorite one, metal. And that's because most metal songs feature bass players just chasing around the guitar riff note for note on a big old long instrument with thick strings and stuff, and it's just not really that fun. But lucky for us, there's a long list of master bassists out there that we can learn from, take ideas from, and make our playing more better. And that's what we're talking about today. As we all know, getting a great bass tone starts with getting your mitts wrapped around a great bass, which is why I'm holding on tightly to this beautiful Spectre Euro 5 string. I just picked this up this month as part of Sweetwater's Guitar Month, which extends all the way through September. And because I bought it through Sweetwater, that of course means it went through their legendary 55 point inspection process. This thing literally showed up in tune out of the box. Everything was set up great. They go through all the guitars and stuff with fine tooth combs. So anytime you order something from them, you know it's gonna show up in perfect shape and super playable. And of course, from there, you've got Sweetwater's legendary customer service there to check on you and make sure you're happy with your purchase later on. Their customer service is seriously so good, there's like memes about it. It's almost hilarious. They'll give you a call and make sure you're happy with your purchase. They'll feed your cats while you're out of town, send you birthday cards, all kinds of nice stuff. So be sure to click the Sweetwater affiliate link down there in the video description below. Shop around and find yourself something nice to celebrate Guitar Month or Big Guitar Month. If you like this video and want to help support my channel as well as gain access to a ton of downloadable tabs, backing tracks, and bonus lessons, consider signing up to my Patreon page today over at patreon.com slash benellerguitars. Even for just a buck a month, you get access to all kinds of goodies, so don't delay. Sign up today. Thanks. Yeah, a lot of times in heavy metal, our guitar players love to write those very classically inspired dual harmonized kind of riffs. That kind of riff writing is really common in like power metal and really any European influenced metal. But it all started with a little band that you've probably heard of called Iron Maiden. A lot of Maiden's riffs are that style, featuring the guitarist just playing a single repeating guitar riff with like a cool harmony over it. But Steve Harris manages to keep it sounding really interesting by using something that we call implied harmony. Rather than just matching the guitar part a couple octaves down, note for note, a lot of times what he'll do is to pick a single bass note that sounds really cool against the riff, and then change it to a different bass note, then maybe even change it to another one the next time around. The guitars are not moving at all. They're just playing the same thing over and over and over. But what is changing is the way that our ears perceive what they're playing. More on this as we go, but just let me give you an example of what it would sound like if you had kind of that cool, typical European sort of metal riff with the bass following it note by note. You'll notice it just sounds really boring and repetitive. So that kind of bass playing does the job and it sounds okay, but there's just no forward momentum to it. There's no movement going on. It just sounds like the same thing being played over and over and again because that's exactly what's happening. Yeah, what Steve Harris is really great at that we can learn from and add to our own playing is simplifying this. And instead of playing the riff itself note by note, find a bass note that sounds really cool against that riff and then go hunting around for another one that might sound really cool. The lesson you gotta remember is that bass is boss, right? Whenever you got the guitars up here playing their tinkly high stuff, it might mean one thing if we hear a certain bass note under it, and then if we change to a different note on the bottom, it completely changes the way that our ears perceive what's going on with the guitars. Sounds like everything changed, when in reality, all that changed is us on the low end. Let me give you guys an example of what that same section would sound like if the bass was moving around Steve Harris style. You'll notice also, too, I'm gonna grab the like signature lick at the end of the riff, that just kind of ties everything together nicely and really makes it sound like the guitars and basses are playing together. Let's check it out. That sounds much cooler, right? There's that forward momentum, that drive that we are looking for that gives us that kind of Iron Maiden flavor. It keeps it from sounding like the same thing is just happening over and over and again. Really ties the whole thing together nicely. Now the ear trick, oral illusion, if we want to call it that and sound fancy, 
that's happening there that's making this all sound like the riff is changing, even though it's not, all has to do with the world of implied harmony. And this is something that every musician of every style should study and understand. We're just talking about what our ears are perceiving as the melody up top and how those notes relate back to what's going on with the bass notes in the bottom. Really important stuff to study. So that guitar part right there is based on A minor. And you can hear it really leans into the root note there, A, over and over and over again. Now the bass part that I wrote there started off on A. Now underneath an A bass note, we perceive that A in the melody as the root. Root, root. The next bass note that I moved to was a low F note. Now, with an F in the bass, our ears no longer hear this A note as root. It actually hears it as a third, because F to A is a major third. So whenever we have that exact same melody taking place under an F note, our ears hear it as something completely different than how they did when they heard it under A. And lastly, I move the bass note down to a D. Now again, underneath the note D, our ears perceive that A note that the guitars are hitting so much as its fifth instead. Sounds kind of like this. So by changing that bass note throughout there, we got to hear that A note sounding like a root, sounding like a third, and sounding like a fifth. And that's a whole lot more interesting than us just playing with the guitars we're already doing more lower. And yes, before somebody can jump my ass about it in the comments, I am playing bass with a pick today, and I'm not ashamed of it. I know somebody out there is gonna be like, real bass players play with their fingers. I do, I play finger style bass all the freaking time. I think that a real bass player plays whatever he thinks sounds best for the song, not for the trolls in the YouTube comment section. Easily one of the most important and influential bass players in metal history has got to be the late, great Cliff Burton from Metallica. Now obviously we could spend like years deep diving into all the stuff that made Cliff such an awesome bass player, but one thing that I took from his playing is something that I picked up from one of the segments in For Whom the Bell Tolls. Cliff had a great understanding of that extra octave worth of separation that we have from the guitars and the space that that creates. And one thing that Cliff did that was really cool is introduce the next riff of the song while the guitars are doing something simple. The section of the tune I'm talking about is pretty early in the song, and it's where the guitars are just holding up those F sharp and E power chords. Pretty simple stuff. Meanwhile, Cliff was introducing some really strong harmonic tension as well as some good forward momentum for the song by introducing the next riff of the tune underneath it. It's a really cool effect where you can just kind of like hear this, you know, storm on the horizon and then the rest of the band jumps in that riff and it's like the heaviest part of the song. Now even though this is an idea that Cliff put out there like 40 years ago, this is still something that bass players are getting mileage out of, especially in like hardcore and deathcore and even some of the gent kind of subgenres. For this example, I've got the low string here on the Spectre tuned down to an A which is ludicrously low, but this bass still makes it sound as clear as like a grand piano. Now the guitars are just doing a simple, you know, power chord chuggy breakdown kind of thing, like you might hear in, like, let's say a Whitechapel song or something like that. But the bass is going ahead and moving forward and keeping things moving underneath there, introducing the next riff of the song. That makes it all the more punishing whenever the guitars and everybody jumps in and starts mimicking the bass. Let's check this out. Now we can also turn that strategy on its head and do the exact opposite thing. If the guitars are playing the busy part, keeping things moving like that, we can be the ones doing something simple. Do the traditional bass player thing and listen to your drummer and lock into his groove. Play whatever he's doing like on his kick drums or something as a single note down there on the bottom. 
Doing this creates a lot of space in a riff. It's not just like non-stop low end bludgeoning you to death, which is especially important when you're in these super low tunings like this. Let's hear that same example, but this time with the reverse Cliff Burton strategy applied. Earlier in the video, we talked about Steve Harris from Iron Maiden and his use of implied harmony, and now we're gonna dig a little bit more deeply into that, because this is a concept that you can really get some cool results out of if you know how to play bass lines that feature triads. On the guitar side of things, for everything from like hard rock to punk to heavy metal, the basic food group of choice is the almighty power chord. These two note chords are really interesting because they only feature a root and a fifth. Whenever a chord is just root and fifth, it's not major or minor. It's actually a very neutral sound. Like you'll notice whenever you play a major chord, it just kind of naturally sounds happy. A minor chord sounds sad. Meanwhile, a power chord just kind of sounds. And that's because a power chord lacks the essential flavor molecule that makes a chord sound major or minor, a third. There's two types of thirds out there. There's the regular third, which occurs two whole steps up above the root. So if our root is E, its third would be one step, two steps up. You could also play that by playing down and across onto the next adjacent higher string, root, third. Whenever you combine that root and third, along with a fifth that you had from your power chord, the result sounds like a big ol' happy major chord. The other type of third is what we call a flat third. Some people call this a minor third. And it does exactly what the name says. It's like your third, one, two, three, only it's flattened. So move down one fret lower. So you could also take this adjacent shape that we did, and again, just lower it a half step. Now that flat third combined with your fifth automatically sounds more like a minor chord. It sounds sadder, right? And if you know those triads, then you can take any riff that features basic power chords and impose either a minor or major tonality on top of it. This is actually something that I learned from like the pop punk world. Mike Durnt from Green Day does this all the freaking time. He's one of my favorite bass players in the world. I think he's very underrated actually. But in the world of metal, one of the guys that's excellent at this is maybe my favorite bass player in all of metal, Martin Mendez from Opeth. Again, I think this guy is just ridiculously underrated. He's so great, so tasty and melodic. In this black metal inspired riff, the guitars are just playing two power chords, F sharp and D. I went in and I made the F sharp sound like an F sharp minor by playing a bass line that utilized the notes of an F sharp minor arpeggio. Root, flat third, fifth, and then also a high root again here. Root note up an octave. And then just to make it sound extra black metal, I also made the D power chord into a D minor triad by using this shape right here. Let's check it out. Now obviously turning every power chord that you see into a minor is gonna make it sound super gloomy and stuff, which can be cool, but as they say, variety is the spice of life, and a lot of times mixing up minor and major triads in kind of unpredictable ways can give you a magical and mystical sound like what you hear in a lot of like proggy stuff these days. For the next example, the guitars here are playing power chords based on A, G sharp, F, and E. The bass is going to imply the harmony of A minor, G sharp major, F minor, and E major.
We can also take advantage of that basic cheese pizza nature of a power chord and top it up with all kinds of fancy stuff for even more implied harmony magic. This is something that I saw in my good buddy and longtime musical co-collaborator, Junkyard Joe Roland do whenever he was playing bass in our old instrumental kind of metal fusion band called Ark. Uh, the band is no more, but the songs still exist on the internet on a SoundCloud page. I'll be sure to put a link to that down there in the video description below too so you can hear this music. I'm still really proud of everything that band did. There's a song that that band had called Quarter Life that was written before Joe and I joined the band. It was written by the guitar player Chris Hawkins and the drummer Ian Schur. It's a really, really, really sick tune, and we kind of dressed it up a little bit as we started to play it out live more and start putting our own touches on it and stuff. There at the end of the song, there's a section that goes from like an A to like an F kind of section. And again, just big power chords and stuff. It was like really moody and dramatic sounding. And Joe did this really cool thing where he took those power chords and dressed them up as minor add nine chords with this cool sort of tapping arpeggio that he would do. The minor add nine chord is kind of like your regular minor. It's got the root, flat third, and fifth in there. It also adds in the German interval, the nine, which you could say is the note a whole step above the root. So you'd end up with something that sounds like this. Root, nine, flat third, fifth, root, nine, flat third, fifth. And Joe would tap out those intervals of root, fifth, ninth, and flat third with this cool arpeggiated pattern like this. And then move that entire idea to an F minor add nine right here. Here's something reminiscent of that section of the song that way you can hear this arpeggio pattern in action. Part of being a good bass player in any genre of music is knowing when to take up space and when to leave space. And in my opinion, former Megadeth bass player Dave Ellefson is one of the guys that knows how to do this the best. Let's take for example the way that he plays during the verse parts of Symphony of Destruction by Megadeth. That's one of those tunes that you can go here on YouTube and type in Symphony of Destruction bass only and find his isolated bass track and give that a listen. First things first, pay attention to how absolutely awesome that tone is and how great his pick attack is. Again, tell me that would sound better played finger style. It wouldn't. He played the right thing for the song. That's what bass playing is really all about. But you'll notice during that that he doesn't just mimic the guitar riff and play with all this space in it. That would have been fine, but he really propels the tune forward more by filling in all those gaps with some palm muted low E like this. Again, it really keeps all the momentum going forward. And a lot of bass players are like scared to palm mute and stuff, but I really like that tone, especially in metal stuff. You almost lose what note it is and it just becomes another percussion instrument at that point. It's a really cool effect you can use in your playing. I use it all the time. And the way that I like to fill in space with my playing the way that Dave does is to listen to the drummer and really tune in on that. Now, if the guitars and the drums and the bass are all playing really tight together, that can sound awesome. But then if the drummer wants to kind of push things forward or add some more momentum to the tune by maybe like going from a closed hat to like an open hat or something like that, just something that is driving forwards, I'll match that a lot of times on the bass and start filling in space. Again, a palm muted, open, low note, wherever the lowest note of the riff is, always sounds great for this kind of purpose. I've got the bass here in drop D tuning. Let's hear how that sounds in this example of moving from tight to taking up space against the drum part. So 
there you go, guys. Some tips from the metal masters themselves that'll hopefully help you expand out from just copying the guitar note for note all the time in your own metal tunes. Let me know your favorite metal bass player and some of the tricks that they use down in the comments section. There's lots and lots of other guys that I left out of this list, like Rex from Pantera, all kinds of great players out there. Let me know who your favorites are in the comments section below. If you like this video and want to help support my channel, be sure to sign up for my Patreon page today over at patreon.com slash benellerguitars. Over there, you're going to get access to all kinds of downloadable tabs, backing tracks, bonus lessons, and a community of awesome people just like yourself. So don't delay, sign up today. Also, be sure to buy yourself something nice like this lovely Spectre Euro 5-string bass by clicking the Sweetwater affiliate link down there in the video description. Guitar Month runs all the way through September, so be sure to click that link and get yourself something real nice. Well, guys, thanks again for watching. Now get away from the computer and go play yourself some big guitar. Less clicking, more picking, or finger picking, whatever you want to do.